What is up, guys? Welcome back to First Cut. I am Andres. This is RB3. I'm Sabrina. And joining us today, we have Mr. Director Josh Trank. What is up, dude? Hey! Thank Hello. you so much for coming on, man. Thank you for thank you for having me virtually. I appreciate it. Thank no, really, thank you. Yeah, obviously, uh, first things first, man. Quarantine vibes. How are the quarantine vibes hitting you, man? How are you uh, dealing with it? I've been I've been in the quarantine vibes for my whole life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's the joke with all my friends. They're just like you've been in quarantine for as long as you've been alive. So. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's just normal to me. I just feel bad for everybody else because it sort of sucks. Like I, I like it when I feel like I'm the only hermit I know mm, because mm. then nobody bothers me. But now all my other friends who are like have are like perm, are like hermits now and they don't have a choice. So now they're just like at home calling me up and being like, well, what do I do? And I'm just like, leave me alone. Like, yeah. I, like Pretend that you're doing. No, I'm not an asshole like that. Um, no, it's 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 fine. I just feel like, you know, I've taken for granted when I could go out and do things. Yeah, and I actually feel like um, uh, pretty bad about about that. Like, I whenever this is sort of this this wave is over and there's a vaccine or whatever happens, like. I'm looking forward to just maybe doing, going going out there and just like doing things that I normally wouldn't want to do because I never really took the opportunity to do it in the first place. Yeah, I think that's what a lot of people are feeling right now. Obviously, me being a super antisocial, introverted guy, I feel exactly the same way where I'm like, crap, all those times Sabrina asked me out to dance, I was like, nah, I'm good. I'm going to go home and watch movies and play video games. I probably <laughs> should have gone out to dance so that's the plan right I'm, after this. i'm on your team yeah that's me i'm yeah. just like eh, i'm gonna go home and play video games uh but obviously with with this whole quarantine happening with COVID 19 there's been a seismic shift uh all over the world but especially in hollywood when it comes to filmmaking uh we've been talking a lot about the effect of COVID 19 and quarantine obviously on movie theaters, but also on movie studios and on production itself. I work behind the scenes. I work in production. My brother and I uh, have been doing it for a couple of years in LA. And I've personally seen a lot of my PA buddies just moving back home and struggling with the whole thing of, of not being able to have enough income to pay rent in a city like LA. Right. But what, what changes as well is the release strategy of movie theaters and the whole idea of streaming. And obviously with Capone, you have one of the first examples of how uh, you have a, a high quality theater quality movie coming straight to VOD. And that's kind of the only way you can see this movie right now. H how do you feel that affects the future of filmmaking in general and how people are going to watch movies in the future? You know, uh, because it's an extenuating circumstance in which it's it is, well, this moment was not by design, or at least we think it, we think it wasn't, I don't know. I don't, I'm not conspiracy theorists, just chill for a second. It was not by design. Um, this is because of, um, you know, of a, a pandemic. Um, I think the question as it relates to the future beyond this circumstance, it's gonna pretty much be exactly what what it is at this moment, you know, like there are going to be fewer and fewer smaller movies that are going to have theatrical releases. Um, uh, big theater experiences are going to be more reserved for uh, four quadrant mass appeal mainstream movies, which there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I personally have always felt that as, as somebody who is obviously I'm a huge fan of the theatrical experience. I think um, something that would be really cool, it, maybe this this COVID situation will force it into, force the theater industry into rethinking things a little bit, because I don't know how many of them are going to be able to survive after this. There'll probably be a lot of mass consolidation, um, is to maybe think about uh, restructuring physically the theaters so that 
most theaters just are IMAX sized or at least close to that size because the quality of home theater like televisions, 4K t TVs, like you could go pick up a 4K TV at Best Buy, like a 70 inch 4K TV for like $600 or something like that, $700 or like finance it and like pay on Amazon or something like that and like pay like 50 bucks a month. And that thing will last you a really long time, get a surround system. And a lot of people are investing in these like high quality home theater um, experiences. So, you know, before, before the time that we're in right now, before streaming, you know, like there's no way that you can compare a DVD experience on like a big boxy television to just going to a standard small movie theater. Like it was, but what is really driving your average movie goer uh, the same way anymore to just go to any old regular local movie theater to, to see something like, I mean, I saw the recent star Wars movie in a theater in Florida, like in small town, Florida. And it was, it was the shittiest theatrical experience. Like the, the speakers were all blown out. The screen was like really like small. And I'm just like, what is the point? Like what, what is even the point of this? But can you imagine if every movie theater, local movie theater, if the screen was like two times bigger than what you'd expect. Like that's what you go to the theater for, for like a bigger than life experience. So I hope that, and that look, I don't know if that's, if things will change on that level, but that that's something I'd like to see happen. Um, just for the screens to be bigger, for the theaters themselves to be a bit bigger, to compensate for the sort of lack of more titles being in theaters uh, so that the experience feels specifically special compared to what's at home but yeah you are going to see a lot more movies like capone and stuff like that showing up on bod yeah and it's it's something that we we are a little bit lost on when we live in la because we have the privilege of watching movies like parasite in, in a in a theater experience and watching all these incredible smaller indie movies that that we like to talk about the most inside a theater amplifies the experience because that's kind of what you're paying for as well as the theater experience of being right. in a crowd uh i've always found it you know disappointing that we're leading down a road where the vast majority of smaller independent movies seem to be streaming only or eventually will be streaming only um and the four quadrant blockbuster movies because i mean obviously we talked about it because last year the top eight movies in the in domestic us was all disney movies mm -hmm. uh, box office wise. So it kind of shows you that the studio mentality, uh, it's kind of all right. you're going to find in theaters. Right. Right. Yeah. So that's something I, I wanted to bring up as well. The, the second question I'll ask before I toss it to RB3 is, is talking a little bit more about the, the online, uh, relationship between a director and the audience. It's, it's interesting now because just a few yeah. weeks ago, they announced the Snyder cut is officially happening for, uh, DC and HBO Max, which is again another example of streaming, but yep. it's the idea of how audiences now are paying to watch the creator and not necessarily the actors as it was maybe back in the 90s or 80s. And it's that weird relationship where your expectations now for a Nolan movie or for a Jordan Peele movie or for a Zack Snyder movie is that I'm paying for what this creator wants to say. Uh, and what this creator wants to show me because I'm a fan of him. I'm not a fan of the studio and I'm not a fan of the actors. I'm a fan of this creator, uh, which has always been a, a difficult balance between studios and directors, obviously with Marlon Brando uh, in the past. But it's always been this contentious relationship because of the idea of production budget, because of the idea of what you're paying for. So I, I kind of want to bring up the question of like, it's interesting how the evolution of a director, a director is even changing nowadays. Like what it meant to be a director 30 years ago or 20 years ago, maybe even 10 years ago has dramatically changed with this online atmosphere. You know, <clears throat> I think it, it changes. It's, it's organic. Everything changes very organically based off of the way that the product is being consumed and the way that, um, you know, culture just is different. Every little mini generation to mini generation. I mean, 
if you look at 30 years ago, if you look in the 1970s, the focus was on the auteur, the focus was on the filmmaker um, and those filmmaker relationships with their home studio was like their home base, you know? Like if you look at, um, you know, Clint Eastwood with Warner Brothers. I mean, that relationship has existed since since the 70s. You know, there are certain studios that have just been homes to either specific genres or specific filmmakers, right? And that institution has existed for a really, really, really long time. I think it was really by the time we got to the 80s when the focus became more on genre and brand so in the sort of post uh, Jaws era, the post uh, blockbuster era, um, you had a need for what it was that Spielberg's imagination gave people. So Amblin was born. And then you had the Robert Zemeckis's that came out of that. And there was a brand that people associated Amblin with, Goonies, um, uh, 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 poltergeist, you know, like it's like a very specific type of movie that you can attribute to Spielberg or to Zemeckis, but it like it all came from that 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 home base, right? Um, or for instance, uh, 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 um, the uh, sort of uh, schlocky, misogynistic like guy comedies from the eighties, you know, like uh, meatballs and like all those kinds of things. Like you've got, like there were specific genres that just sort of emerged and then filmmakers who made movies that catered toward those genres. And then in the 1990s, you know, I think it was the age of just big budgets and, and who had the, like the most expensive movie ever made suddenly became a question, you know, Terminator 2, I remember when that came out, the big deal was this was the this is the most expensive movie ever made and then pearl harbor no this is the most expensive movie ever made so in the culture surrounding movies at least from what i remember there's always been a different every 5 years there's sort of like a different focus on like what's the what's what what are people associating movies with is it the filmmaker is it the budget is it the genre is it the brand but in the last 10 years, it's been very interesting. Like my career really started to exactly 10 years ago. Um, it's, what are we in? May right now? Fuck mm -hmm. yeah. um, I sold Chronicle to Fox 10 years and two months ago, right? Wow. And so if I look back on the last 10 years, I mean, a lot has happened in the last 10 years and obviously in my own life and everybody's lives, but in the movie industry, it's, there's been a, you know, everything, you know, when you think about it, like Star Wars came back, um, Mar the MCU uh, solidified its position as this like behemoth of, of the, the industry in a way that it never existed before. And if we were having this conversation, like, um, four or five years ago, I, I, my, my feeling would be, uh, the, the audience's association of the movie with the filmmaker is dead. But what you're saying right now about like, for instance, the Snyder cut, uh, or like I, I, you know, seen David Ayer has been talking about his yeah. cut recently. Right. Um, I think suddenly there's this shift into, okay, well, what about the person that made the movie? Because five years ago, I was having conversations with other filmmakers with a lot of these people uh, offline where it's just kind of like, we don't really matter anymore. It's about the brand that we're associated with. You know, like, but like I, I think a lot of anger, in fact, originally about Fantastic Four before I even started shooting. Like a lot of people think like, oh, it really, people were pissed off when the movie finally came out. People were pissed off before we even started shooting that thing because yeah. of just all the changes that I was making and Michael B. Jordan, people completely forget about that. Um, people were hella pissed off about that. Um, and a lot of it had to do with like, how dare this filmmaker step outside the brand? Like it was all about the brand. 
But I think what's really interesting uh, is, you know, in this sort of like the Snyder cut happening, like I've heard a lot of, you know, bloggers and opinions coming out where people are like, but this is setting a precedent with like, you're just going to cater to whiny fans. And I'm just like, look, yo, anything that puts a spotlight on the filmmaker as being important, I'm, I'm going to back it all the way. Like, that's just what I'm about. That's why I stepped into this in the first place. That's why, that's why I've always wanted to do this. I'm a fan of filmmakers before everything, you know? Um, yeah. But what I think, what I think is really fascinating too is like, whether a lot of young film fans know it, like a lot of kids who are like 11 years old, 12 years old, who like just grew up more on YouTube creators than they did on anything else. I think they're really sort of primed to uh, identify the works of film with a singular person or a singular vision. Because like, if you watch PewDiePie or if that's who you grew up watching or something like that, like, you know that whether or not PewDiePie's got a whole factory behind PewDiePie, you see PewDiePie. That's like his vision, it's his personality. And I think it would be really dope if like young like kids who are just getting into movies can identify a movie with a singular personality that exists with that movie or a singular uh, ex uh, spiritual expression, as opposed to looking at a movie and deciding whether it accurately accurately fits into your idea of what the big brand should be if that makes sense oh yeah. totally and, and, and i was going to say that's pretty much exactly what we create this podcast to encourage and to emphasize the meaning of podcast is to highlight the directors and the deeper meanings in their films and identify yeah. the individual personality traits that we could you know dissect from watching their entire filmography what's the commonalities and um you know that's why we applaud you so much for coming on the show. This is the first time we've actually had a director on here who could discuss their own filmography really? and kind of put their own authorship. Yeah, yeah. This is 100% oh. the first time we've ever done something like this. So thank you so much. Uh, but, you know, that, that, that kind of... People on, man. Oh, man, I appreciate it. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll talk. We'll figure that out. No, oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, that'd be great. That'd be great. Um, but that kind of leads right into my next question, though. Like, you know, you're obviously, you know, you, you have has successful movies and you're a successful Hollywood director. And we're having this conversation about um, authorship and authorship, right? Like, uh, what are your overall thoughts on like the amount of credit that directors like typically get? Like, you know, do you think they get enough credit? Do you think they get too much credit? Do you think there's a lot more behind the movie than just the director? Or do you think there should be a lot more focus just on the, on the director or directors themselves? I'm just for transparency in general. So mm. it's a, a if you so when you're directing a movie and you're on, you're on set your job is uh, to answer everybody's questions because everybody's el everybody else's job is to figure out what your vision is for all of the little pieces that they're putting together. That and it's like I'd like to think of it a little bit like a mil like a military operation. Um, I have a couple of really some of my closest friends are like like super military operator dudes, right? And I how I talk to them a lot about filmmaking because and they and and I learn a lot more from them about how like crazy military operations work, like spec ops shit because the teamwork involved the planning the precision the the um uh uh tactical awareness the ability to improvise when things don't go according to plan which often is what happens it's very similar to filmmaking so if you want to think about like a director as being like either a squad leader or a general or something like that you know, a general isn't going to just, you know, isn't like running out and killing everybody on the, in the, uh, you know, isn't going out and killing all the bad guys himself. Like it takes the whole team and you need the expertise of everybody else and the skills and the physical, you know, um, presence of, of all of these other people. I mean, it's this massive collaboration. So if, 
it just ultimately depends on how interested you are in filmmaking. So if you're a casual fan and you don't really care that much about what a property master is, probably not going to care, <laughs> you know, like you probably just want to know like, okay, maybe who's starring in it or who's the director and that's okay. You know, like it's, it's fine. Um, but if you are really interested in how filmmaking works, like it's, you, you, want to start with okay who wrote the script where did the idea come from you know is it the director who is also who is also the writer um or did the script end up in a director's hands how did that happen it all starts with just like the idea of the story and how that travels to a group of people who all make it in collaboration but um yeah i don't know it's kind of a hard question to answer in terms of how much credit should a filmmaker be given that? That's why I always opt for transparency because I think it ultimately depends. I mean, I know plenty of movies and plenty of movies that we could all look up right now to find instances of uh, where some of our favorite movies or the most popular movies ever made were like maybe saved or really made by a group of producers for whatever reason. Um, and then there's other situations that are the polar opposite. I mean, you know, like I, th I think the tendency is to sort of look at different, I think the tendency that a lot of people have, and, and I don't blame anybody for this because I'm, I'm only self-aware of this because I used to think about this in the same way where I'd be like, okay, well, how does this director stack up to how this other director would do it? Right. Well, James Cameron would just tell everybody that they're worthless and then they would be so insecure that they'd be like, fuck, I have to work 25,000 times harder in order to prove myself to James Cameron. But some of them were too weak to survive, so they just quit altogether. But still, despite the fact that everybody hated him and everybody wanted to quit and his approach was everyday borderline abuse mentally and emotionally the movie still is the most successful movie of all time you know like there are stories like that does that make it right does that make that the right way to do it yeah for james cameron <laughs> i can't yeah. speak to that you know but i we know that happened but these are just tales you know like yeah. terry gilliam for instance terry gilliam is one of my all-time heroes terry gilliam is the reason why i felt it in in like in my chest that I had to fight studios the way that I thought I had to fight studios. And I don't blame him for that. Like, cause I'm sure Terry Gilliam would have sat down across from me five, six years ago and been like, bruh, like shit, like calm down, you know, like, but his tale of fighting for his cut of Brazil, um, is legendary. I mean, he walked into Sid Scheinberg's office at Universal and said he's going to blow up the building. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it kind of goes hand in hand with the idea of filmmaking being such a difficult art form because it requires you to pitch to studios in order to get the budget you need to make it, right. which actually goes back to your first uh, uh, feature film, which is Chronicle. And the idea of taking that found footage element yeah. Uh, and using that as an ability to to have a little bit more authorship over your own film. And I know Sabrina had thoughts on that as well. Yeah, well, I, well I just want to say one thing yeah. is, is a counter to the to the Terry Gilliam and to the James Cameron. Sure. At the same time, you have Ron Howard, right? Mm. If you look at Ron Howard, who's making movies at the same time as James Cameron and as Terry Gilliam, this is somebody who's had the polar opposite approach. And he's made so many legendary films that we still talk about today. And he, he's not as hyperly involved in every little detail. He gives it up to all of the most talented cinematographers and editors, and he knows who the right artists are to bring into the fold and, and read scripts all the time. He's a conduit for all of this talent. That's also the right way to do it. So my main point that I was trying to make with all that is like, what, there are many different ways to go about looking at the role of a director or a filmmaker in terms of approach. 
and in terms of you know how much credit needs to be given to who, whoever it is and it's not and i don't think it's up to me or any of us to say like which is the right way to go about it because i see it as all art equally no matter what so like i as a fan of art and as a fan of movies, I want there to be crazy James Camerons out there, like, you know, breaking sets and screaming and making movies that, you know, are like Titanic. And then I also want to see Ron Howard's making movies. So yeah. anyhow. No, absolutely. Yeah. So for Chronicle, uh, you revitalize the found footage genre in multiple ways, kind of bringing in fresh ideas like using telekinesis as a tool in the camera work, uh, incorporating the security footage, police dash cams. That's kind of stuff that really reinvigorated that genre. So how did that idea bring up um, to bring up those alternate shots kind of come about within the film? So uh, are, are you all familiar with the movie called Grizzly Man? I'm not. No. no. Oh, I check it out. Werner Herzog has been around forever. I mean, I just immediately go check out his filmography. Like he's just, he's amazing. And he's made, he has such a, uh, an interesting range of films that he's made in his career from just like investigative documentaries to cinema verite style films to full on narrative. Like he's just the full gamut. He's, made documentaries about his own failed friendship with failed friendships. Like he's just incredible. There's, there's, and there's a documentary about him just eating his shoe, which is, we can talk about that later, but anyway. So there's a film that he made called Grizzly Man. It's a documentary um, composed of uh, footage that he stumbled on um, that was all shot by this outdoorsman named Timothy Treadwell. And Timothy Treadwell spent, I think it was like 15 or 16 summers tra uh, traveling up to the Alaskan wilds to live amongst the grizzly bears. And Timothy Treadwell had a very, very interesting life. He uh, was a, a, an aspiring actor who was living in Santa Monica and his life kind of wasn't going the way he wanted it to like many actors who move out to, you know, uh, go after their dreams. And it, so his dreams weren't working out and he just became obsessed with the preservation of the grizzlies in Alaska. So every summer he started going up with a camera that he saved up money for and he started filming the grizzlies and started becoming familiar with their territory and living with them. And over the course of his time, um, uh, the time that he, he spent up there, um, he became more and more comfortable crossing boundaries that humans shouldn't cross with grizzly bears. And eventually he was eaten by a grizzly bear, uh, him and his girlfriend. And all the audio, it was recorded. Um, so uh, Werner Herzog made a film based on all of Timothy's footage. I mean, it's a beautiful film. And just for Werner Herzog's voiceover alone, it's just worth watching. But uh, I was very inspired by that movie. Um, I mean, I'm, I, I love documentaries in general, but um, where a lot of my own ideas about the sort of cinema approach to the camera style, the found footage style of Chronicle came from, was uh, came out of the permission that that film granted me in that most found footage movies up to that point had this connotation of shaky cam, quote unquote. And that's not something that I was interested in. And I wanted to dispel that myth of the whole sort of like, well, it's on somebody's phone. And this is like, people don't really think about that today because we're more used to footage with stabilizers on your their, on your cameras already and stuff like that. But the stigma of all quote unquote found footage movies back in the day was just old people being like, I can't watch this because it's so shaky. So, but when you watch Grizzly Man, this is a document, this is footage that is shot by an amateur cinematographer who you can see over the course of the, the time from when he starts living with the Grizzlies to like 10 summers later, 
his camera work becomes so much better and so much smoother because he's becoming like a professional over the course of time. And I thought that that was an interesting an arc, an interesting arc for the camera work. And at one point, Werner Herzog comments on it by talking about how Timothy, who seems like he's guys out of his mind, but how he's such a, a filmmaker in the truest sense. So that's what I wanted to bring to Andrew as a character in, in the film. Um, somebody who begins his relationship with filming his world for an, out of an emotional need to show people what he sees in his daily life. And that passion becomes a part of his aesthetic naturally as the story progresses. And then as the telekinesis starts to play a part in, play, starts to play a part into the story, just naturally he would start using the telekinesis to operate the camera hands-free. And a shot that's in that movie that, I mean, like I cried my eyes out. The first time like I really cried from just something in my own filmmaking experience was, cause that was a shot that I had dreamt of since I was in high school of a kid holding his camera in the mirror and then letting go of it and the camera turning around and looking back at him. Like I dreamt of that forever, but I didn't know I'd do special effects or anything like that. And that's a scene in the movie and it's happening in the context of his family falling apart off screen and you're hearing this horrible stuff, but he's distracting himself by the joy of this secret that he owned, that he has with himself and his camera. Um, so when the camera turns around and it looks at him, uh, that's that turning point in the film where you realize, you know, that um, that this is this goes beyond found footage or that that kind of style. So it was very conscious, uh, a conscientious, um, intentional thing in that film to you know build a specific style um, and an arc with the camera work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it feels you know it feels like so Chronicle. I remember when I first saw Chronicle in, in theaters. Um, in 2012, I was like just starting high school and like, you know, it felt like so real and so authentic, like, and so fresh and inventive. And it felt like something that represented like, you know, this generation, like our, like, you know, our generation. Um, so I guess my question is like, how much of your life have you spent like conceptualizing this movie? Because, you know, a lot of times they say with, you know, artists and, you know, with music and with movies, like, you know, you spend your first your first movie or your first album, you spend your entire life making it. Did you spend a lot of your early life kind of thinking of concepts for Chronicle? Yeah, that's, it's so true. I never thought about that. That's so true. Cause that's, that's what it was for me. I mean, it Chronicle, I've always, I've always wanted to make movies since I was, as long as I could remember since I was, there's like my, my dad is a documentary filmmaker. So I'm, I'm very, very lucky that I grew up with somebody who's already kind of doing that for a living. Um, so my dad used to film us all the time. Like, uh, I mean, it's obviously it's common that everybody's filming everybody today, but like, you know, back in the early eighties uh, when I was a kid, like not everybody had cameras and shit at home. Um, but there's, when I was three, there's footage of like my dad, me saying that I wanted to make films when I was like that age, you know, like I just always wanted to do it. I've always dreamt of do, working with a camera and telling a story. But where I really knew that I needed to was when I first saw uh, the film Akira. Um, mm. uh, I mean, I always like, you know, and I, I saw that movie very, very, very early um, uh, at, a, at a friend's house. I must have been... I don't know, like six or seven years old. And I remember my, my friend's older brother was like a, like just super Comic-Con guy back in, you know, late eighties, early nineties when Comic-Con in San Diego wasn't this like institution the way it is now, you know, and he had that movie on VHS and the, uh, that, that's a movie that I just always lived inside of on, on some level. Like, even there are so many movies like today, I'm sure everybody can relate to this, that when a movie ends, you're still living inside that movie all the time on some level. Mm -hmm. And Hero was one that I always lived in and I always wanted to like either adapt or remake or 
tell that story in my own way that made sense to me in how I just related to Tetsuo and that relationship between Tetsuo and Canada with their that 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 bond that they had between each other that Tetsuo is always being picked on by everybody and Canada is like kind of the cool popular guy who is going out of his way to defend Tetsuo all the time despite the fact that every nobody likes Tetsuo and that was like a lot of my earliest friendships growing up I was very I was always like bullied and awkward and stuff and one of my best friends when I was in middle school was the most popular kid in school um and his name was Andrew and I it's funny because I have pretty much on some level either reconnected or I, I know what's going on with pretty much most of the people I grew up with. I have not, I don't know what's happened to him since I was 16 years old. So if he's out there, Andrew, you know, thanks for having my back, you know, but he, he used to like fight with kids physically for bullying me and everybody was like afraid of him and they respected him, you know, and that was just a parallel that I had in my life. So every time I'd revisit, Akira growing up, I felt like I was in that movie. So there's so much of Chronicle's DNA stems from Akira and my own um, way of uh, uh, the way I related to it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting because I'm looking at my notes right now for Chronicle and, and I'm going to kind of break off. This is usually what I do, but I have to. As, as, an, as the nerd that I am, I have to talk about the the telekinetic angle of the whole thing. Um, because again, this is a guy who me, I grew up with comic books and I grew up with Star Wars, obviously. And that's kind of the first time I saw telekinesis on screen because the force is a way of telekinesis. Uh, just that idea and the idea of the evolution of almost like you're working on a muscle of a superpower, right? Where the more you do it, the more you improve till eventually at the end of the movie, the third act, we see this crazy Superman style battle scene because of how they were able to perfect their telekinetic powers. But just that whole idea of, of using telekinesis as the superpower you wanted and the way it evolved through time. Yeah, I love how you said that because I got so much deja vu just reminded me of how for a good five or six years when I would just be talking to people about that idea in the movie, yeah. that's just like how I would describe it. You know, that you're just, it's like working out, you get stronger at it. If at the very beginning you, you realize like you can move, you know, like a, a bottle cap or something like that. And the more that you practice it, suddenly you can lift the bottle and then you can lift you know, your refrigerator. And then eventually what's stopping you from lifting or moving your own body? Yes. And the idea of what that would look like by targeting yourself in that sort of sloppy haphazard way where it's, you would, if that's why in the movie, when, when they first start learning how to fly and lift themselves up that you see all the particles on the ground are kind of coming up with them and then falling down because it's, it's, that's, it's, would, that's what it would look like, I think. But yeah, that was something I just like, it was a concept that I was just obsessed with for a really, really, really long time. So it was just, it's, it's cool that it, it just made sense to everybody else. And it's really, it's really beautiful. Cause I think it truly captures kind of what it would be like to be so young and get powers like that at the time. And of course you have Michael B. Jordan and Dane DeHaan and they're still um, great actors doing amazing things today. But um, it feels so authentic, the relationship that the three of them have. So did the actors improvise a lot or was it shot pretty much like close to the script? It was shot in a combination of very close to the script and also just a uh, looseness and spontaneity of just blocking out scenes and uh, working with Matthew Jensen, my cinematographer on Chronicle um, and with the actors and sort of finding this, every single shot in the movie is the entire scene, you know? So each shot is a scene. So we'd be like, well, what's the story of this shot? You know, where does it start? What's the middle? What's the end? Or what's the gag that happens in it? How do we accomplish the gag? Um, I also spent a good, um, I think four months or longer, 
um, with my friend Troy Morgan, who is a brilliant storyboard artist and previs artist who I've worked with um, since Chronicle. He, we also sp spent a good five months working together on Fonzo slash Capone and on Fantastic Four. And I actually, I met him on Chronicle. So it was me and just a small team of about three other people. And we pre and storyboarded um, the entire movie from start to finish. And that's something I always like to do, uh, not as a method by which I want to rigidly lay a groundwork for everything and it has to be this way. It's actually so that I can, if I'm the more overprepared I am, the more room we have later on to improvise and change those rules, which brings me back to what I was saying about military planning. Like if you're planning for a raid or for some military operation, you wanna rehearse that motherfucker to death until you know every possible way that you can do it and what's the plan A, what's the plan B, what's the plan C? Because then when you get there, plan A through C may not even work out, but you know, you know, you know the ins and outs. So like, and that's what you just find with filmmaking. You show up and then it's just like, oh shit, it, there's a, a storm that's happening. So now we can't even shoot that scene uh, outside. It has to be an indoor scene or something like that. And it just changes it all up. And there's all these things that happen, um, which is the, the fun and the beauty of filmmaking is just how like ev plans can change so quickly. Yeah, and obviously the one following up Chronicle, and speaking of Michael, uh, Michael B. Jordan was in Chronicle, and you brought him back for Fantastic Four. Uh, and, and obviously, Fantastic Four is this giant thing within itself, not just because of the budget, but because of the property. <laughs> no, it's uh, yeah, it's true. I'm I mean, sorry. it's just I, I, I have a sense of humor. So. Yeah, of course. And, and, and it's one of those things too. But uh, the first thing I want to ask, obviously, and I think it's all three of us wanted to ask this question. It's the idea, especially nowadays, and obviously this was back in the day, uh, I think it was 2012, 2014? Uh, was, what, when it came out? Yeah. yeah. 2015, uh, right? Yeah. 2015. The, uh, the day I will never forget, August 15th, <laughs> 2015 or August 9th? Yeah. <laughs> but, it's, but it's that idea of, of getting an actor like Michael B. Jordan, who is obviously already one of the biggest stars in Hollywood right now, yeah. to play Johnny Storm and, and the importance that, that RB3 and Sabrina and I kind of put on diversity on screen, especially with the character that people might recognize because it shows a different side to it. I, I don't know what your thought process was behind that casting of Michael B. Jordan as the role of Johnny Storm. It just started out initially like Fox approached me about Fantastic Four in sort of two months before Chronicle came out. And I've, I'd always had my eyes on X-Men a bit because I just felt like there was something, I always loved the X-Men cartoon in the 90s and just the vibe of X-Men I've always fucked with, just the, the, the sort of like how I connect with Akira, just these misfits and outcasts who don't belong anywhere necessarily, but they need each other. And just like, I just love, I love X-Men. And so um, the head of the studio brought up uh, Fantastic Four to me and I was kind of like, yeah, okay. Like I was like, not at, at first I wasn't completely sure, but I knew the characters. I didn't know the comics as well, but I knew that I knew exactly who the characters were. Um, especially Ben Grimm being a specifically Jewish character. So as a Jew, I'm like, hey, you know, there's my guy, right? Um, so I spent maybe like a week or two just thinking about it. And I kept thinking about David Cronenberg and body horror and just sort of like how traumatizing of an experience that would really be. Cosmic rays altering the course of your genetics forever and just how interesting and terrifying that would be. And so I, I, I lived in that for a moment and then um, me and Mike were just, became like just really, really tight friends. Like he'd come over to my house all the time and hang out with me and my mom. And like, we, he, like Mike is just family. Like we just immediately from the moment he came in to, cause we did a lot of auditioning on Chronicle with a lot of people. And like, Mike just reminded me of like, somebody that was one of my friends growing up like in, like in LA he was just somebody who felt so familiar to me and he and I felt familiar to him so we just clicked from the beginning 
So he was one of the first people I told, um, I told, I, I, he was one of the first people I told uh, um, uh, about Fantastic Four and he was like, like he loved Fantastic Four and we both kind of looked at each other and were like, Johnny Storm? You know, like it just kind of started out like that. And so the question of diversity, it was like maybe the second thought, to be honest, you know, because it yep. wasn't really like, I didn't think about that as much, like, because to me, that's by default, you need diversity in movies. Yes. I mean, in Chronicle, in the script, it doesn't specifically say that Steve is a black guy. Like it doesn't say that in the script. It's these three kids. And to me, that's just sort of like, that's not three white kids, that's three kids, you know? So I, but that's just me because, you know, some people might think, not think of it like that. They may just be like, hey, I just know, grew up with white people, so that's all I identify with. But I mean, I grew up in a very diverse, you know, environment in Los Angeles. So to me, it's always important to show a world that reflects the world that I see. Otherwise, it's kind of creepy and weird. Like I'm not. That's not. I don't want to. I don't want to see a movie about a bunch of white people. Like that's just not interesting to me. Unless, unless it had. It's saying something specifically about a world that is inherently white, because yeah. that is important to see. Like for instance, you know, like if you look at Silicon Valley in the early '90s or something like that, or the mid '90s. That was like the whitest world that possibly existed. But you look at Silicon Valley now, it's like completely diverse. But like, if you wanted to show something for historical purposes, like, you know, then then that's important. But like, in terms of, you know, uh, a story about four young people whose lives are forever changed by these incredible extenuate, like, you want to see a diverse cast. Like, it just goes without saying. So for Mike and I, that was just a natural conclusion. Like, of course you're going to be Johnny Storm because you're the fucking coolest dude there is. You've got charisma for fucking days. Like who else would play Johnny Storm? Like I just, it made sense. So uh, I brought him, brought it up to the studio and they were just like, perfect. Like there was just no question about it. But the best was when I, I, I sat down with St uh, Stan Lee um, and he had seen Chronicle and, and loved it, which was crazy, uh, to get that email that he saw Chronicle. Insane. And I sat down with him in his office in Beverly Hills and it wasn't so much a question of like going in there and asking permission because I always knew that Stan Lee was like a forward thinking dude. I mean... You know, we're from a generation and a time where the question of, of diversity, it's weird because why is that even a question that's happening right now? Whereas like a lot of people from the so-called like the pre-boomer generation or whatever, the people in the 60s who were literally marching for civil rights back when that was like not even like that civil rights was a question. Like people from Stan Lee's generation, they, the, they, they want they wanted the diversity up front and center. That was everything that was important to them. That's why they created characters like Black Panther, like Luke Cage, like that. that's where that came from. So I knew that that's something that Stan Lee would be into. And he was immediately, immediately. Like we started talking about Chronicle and I just said, did you like Michael B. Jordan? He was just like, he's like, ah, the mighty Michael B. Jordan. Like immediately he's like throwing his like Stan Lee, you know, stamp on it. And I said, what about, what, what do you think about him as Johnny Storm? And he goes, I love it. Yeah. And, man, I that's awesome. it. Hey, cool. and I'm like, I'm like, all right. And then I was like, hung on it for a second. And I'm like, well, I got a question for you. And he said, sure. Okay. So, you know, Michael's black. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, there are some people who are going to be weird about that because of the world that we live in. And he goes, who cares? I yeah. think it's great and I love it. Well, if anything, it's it's even more important, right? So, yeah. You should go with the best person for the job. Yeah. And that that was it. And it just made sense. I thought there was gonna be a little bit of blowback, like a little bit, because in the corners of the internet, but I yeah. had no idea, which probably just speaks to my own like whiteness or privilege that I wouldn't 
be aware of how intense of a race racist reaction there would be to that. But yeah, I was, I was shocked. Like it was it from the moment that was announced. I mean, I had, I left Twitter because of it for uh, about, I don't know, two years or something like that, a year. And then I eventually came back, but it was just my mentions were filled with so much rage and just racist shit left and right. And the message boards, I mean, I don't know if you guys remember the IMDB message boards. But oh, I remember. Wasteland. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. I mean, there were message there were message boards that were literally about wanting to kill me and to kill Mike. And it freaked me the fuck out, you know, like, but I'm the kind of person like, look, the more you push against me with that kind of shit, the more I'm going to feel encouraged to go straight after whatever that is. Like, I'm just stubborn. So, you know, even though it didn't work out, obviously, like the movie, that's a whole different story in and of itself. Like, I mean, I don't regret any of it to begin with, but, you know, that was that was a, a very interesting t- a time to sort of go through because if we were doing that same shit right now, you would definitely have your detractors and you'd have that. But like, I think that there's more of a majority presence on the internet that would beat those voices down. Whereas yeah. I'm telling you guys, like in 2013, 2012, when that was announced, those voices were not loud like that uh, in opposition to the racism that existed yeah. on the internet. There was no woke people popping up in the mentions being like, you know, with the clapping hand emoji, every word, like, mm-hmm. down. like that shit was not happening. Um, so yeah, I mean, I feel like me and Mike were kind of like fighting against the tide a bit back then. Well, it's good, right? Because you want to be ahead of the time. You you want to push that envelope forward. I mean, think about back to, I believe it was around that time when John Boyega was cast in Star Wars. You had a right. similar reaction of, of just complete racism and hatred around a character. Black, who Star- was a black Stormtrooper? Yeah. Black, it was like, motherfucker, it's st- they're Stormtroopers. What do you Yeah. <laughs> right, right. But it's that idea, uh, especially now, because I feel like what we like to talk about here on the podcast and on the show is is realizing, opening your eyes to the world that we live in. And obviously, uh, just everything that's been going on this last week, as far as uh, as far as our justice system and as far as the policing system and the importance of amplifying these voices, uh, whether it be in a small role or a big role. Uh, yeah, RB3 has the Black Lives Matter T-shirt. Uh, and, and that's something we all uh, agree on because it, it, film it does influence people. And I've talked about it with my family, how I, I kind of view film, especially when it comes to Latin people. Uh, I've talked a lot about the representation of Latinos in film and how it's usually a negative portrayal or some sort of villainous portrayal or thug portrayal. Um, and the importance of seeing Latin characters in a powerful dynamic role to influence people who might not have grown up with Latinos and only hear what the president is saying of Latinos. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I just, for one, wanted to bring that up right away when it came to Fantastic Four with Michael B. Jordan, because it is something that's that's noteworthy and it's important. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, and- it was an int- it was an interesting it was an inter- interesting dynamic in even development of that character in a way that I also found to be very annoying at times because again, to me, I was coming from a place where I did, I saw it as a casual reality of a casual diversity. Cause yeah. like, Hey, look, this is a pretty diverse four boxes of people talking here right now, but we're not being, we're not like uh, making a thing of it. You know what I mean? Like it's, this is a casual conversation between four human beings. So I'm not thinking about like, well, where do we all fit into our demographic based off of what we're saying and where we're coming from. And, but when you're dealing with a big studio and you're developing those characters, the extra awareness on the fact that, well, this character is black. So how does the blackness factor into this character in a way that separates it from the whiteness of what that character might've been. And it's, it's a, dep- I found it to be this weirdly depressing self-aware thing that like, as the, you know, like sort of being the first of those movies 
to change the quote unquote race of a character, like a, to um, it, it became, I, I, from my POV, I wanted to just embrace it as just being casual and not being like, hey, it's, uh, it's the black Johnny Storm. It's just like, no, it's Michael B. Jordan, you know? All right. Well, in, and, and, and going in, in from that, like when you made that decision and when you and Michael B. Jordan made the decision to do the Johnny Storm collaboration, um, did you always plan on them being adopted and from, from the conception or did you ever consider a black woman to play a sister, for example? There was a lot of controversial conversations that were had behind the scenes on that. I was mostly interested in a, a black Sue Storm and a black Johnny Storm and a black Franklin storm. But I also, when you're dealing with a studio on a massive movie like that, everybody wants to keep an open mind to like who the big stars are going to be like, you know, well, maybe it'll be like Margot Robbie or something like that. But when it came down to it, um, I found a lot of uh, pretty heavy pushback on uh, casting a black woman in that role. When I look back on that, um, I should have just walked when that sort of realization hit me. And I feel like embarrassed about that, that I didn't just out of principle. Um, because that's not, those aren't the values that, that I stand for in my own life. And those weren't the values then or ever for me. Um, because I'm somebody who always talks about like, stand, like just standing up for what I believe in, even if it means burning my career out. And I feel bad that I didn't, I didn't take it to the mat um, with that issue. Um, yeah. I felt like, yeah, I feel like I, I failed in that regard. But I, that was a weird, unfortunate um, uh, situation. I don't know how else to put it. But yeah, well, yeah. it's no, it's no fault of your own. You don't have to feel sorry about it or anything. I mean. We all, all, all four of us know how exactly how this industry goes, and you know the kind of pressure that comes with right. this, with 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 working and and networks and all that kind of stuff. So you know, it's like it's not even. Yeah, but you know what, man? Like at the end of the day, I know me, mm -hmm. and I, especially back then, I was like a pit bull about things, and but I was, yeah, it's something I feel more disappointed in. Uh, if there's one regret that I have, and I've talked a lot about not having any regrets, it's that one issue. Yeah, and it also comes with that conversation of a lot of what's going on now, especially with Marvel and all these yeah. huge uh, blockbuster type movies, tapping young up and coming directors, whether it's a John Watts or a Taika Waititi or even a Ryan Coogler for Creed. Um, how, how did you handle that whole idea of jumping from something as small budgeted as Chronicle to now yeah. here comes more, more production budget. That means you're going to have to take a lot more notes to the point where maybe you have, uh, lost authorship of your own film. Well, um, it, it's interesting because I, it was a there was such it was such a long process of working on the script and getting the script to a place where you know this was like from 2012 to 2000 the beginning of 2014 that was two years worth of development um, before I actually got to shooting it you know so there were certain big wins that I certain big wins that I had and certain areas where I had to compromise in order to say like okay. I give them this and they give me that, you know, like I give, I give them, you know, they, they give me Michael B. Jordan and Miles Teller. I give them, uh, Kate Mara, you know, um, who's enormously talented, but you know, like there were certain people that they were really into, um, or like just, just certain concessions. Um, we had a lot of creative disagreements, which is no secret. Um, and a lot of very heated confrontations that took place during pre-production. Um, and uh, right before we started shooting, maybe about two weeks before the date, uh, I had a significant amount of my budget was pulled for reasons that weren't very 
clear to me. Um, There's maybe about I know, like 20 or $30 million that was pulled. So I had to cut some major sequences from the movie and just rely on the previs that I had and hope that the studio would be as jazzed about my 10 week cut as I thought that they would be. So we would ha be able to get those scenes back in additional photography and I would just use the previs as placeholders. Um, but the weird thing is by the time we started shooting, uh, we had a, a 72 day long shooting schedule and we wrapped on day 72, which is not really common. Like for all of the bullshit that people were talking about, like, oh, it was chaos on set. Like there, there was no chaos on set. I mean, it was a challenging shoot like any shoot, but like we were moving the fuck along throughout that. Mm. Shoot. We got it all done. You don't rap on the day that you're scheduled to rap if there's chaos going on. You know, my reps didn't get any wild calls from the studio being like, you got to get this kid under control. Like that just wasn't going on. And weirdly, I didn't get a single note from the studio while we were shooting. I had a little high five moment with my AD um, the day that we wrapped because we were just like, we just got through an entire shoot on a massive, you know, $150 million superhero movie and we didn't get a single note. We just got one request, which was they just wanted to get a wide angle of one scene that I didn't get um, the day before. And that was, that was it. Yeah. Now, but yeah. it, was, it was very much, they just kind of like, once we got to the day of shooting, they just were like, okay, do your thing which is not very common. And I think a lot of it had to do with the sort of complicated politics of the fact that I was in this un very unique position that I don't know if a lot of other filmmakers are going to be able to have again because of how it ended up turning out for me. So I apologize to all the young filmmakers for ruining this for them. <laughs> um, sorry guys. Uh, but yeah, um, because my, St uh, Star Wars movie. It was announced um, about two weeks into shooting Fantastic Four. Um, that gave me like an unprecedented amount of leverage in that moment with with Fox, with the studio, because I was also attached to one of the biggest shows in town um, with Disney and Lucasfilm. And there was a lot of uh, desire coming from the upper, upper echelon at Fox to want to keep me happy and keep me on as a director because everybody is investing in the future of whoever it is that they're working with because you never know. They're like, in case this dude becomes Spielberg or something like that, we don't want to like step on his toes. You know, that, that, that was the mentality at the time. So I, I had an unprecedented amount of unprecedented amount unprecedented amount of creative control over the movie while we were actually shooting it. Yeah. Um, but again, like it was a unique situation, and every situation is unique. I mean, look, I don't know. I I can't like I for instance, I can't speak for Ryan Coogler. I'm sure he's had very different experience on Black Panther and on Creed. You know, yeah. Ryan is a fucking great dude. Like I got to know him quite a bit, like early on in the beginning, like, he, I mean, he's an amazing dude. Like, and I know that from where he stands as a filmmaker, like he's coming from a different point of passion. So I'm sure he knows different ways to articulate exactly what he wants to other people to get, you know, what, what he needs. And, you know, every filmmaker too is also going to be more fixated on other things than other people filmmakers you know so it just depends on what's important to you so to your question about like getting notes on certain things it depends on what kind of notes you're you know you'll probably be getting based off of whatever it is that you're more focused on so some visual effects driven directors are like they may not get as many notes as it pertains to the visual style of a movie because they're just like, well, this is the visualist person, you know? So it's like, I don't think that Neil Blomkamp is getting feedback on his visuals, like where they're just like, hey, can you make this robot dude do that? And they're like, no, whatever you're doing looks fucking cool because you're Neil Blomkamp, but they're probably beating him up about story points and things like that. 
So it just depends on if you as the filmmaker, what your, um, I wouldn't ever say strengths or weaknesses. I would just say what's more important to you and what's less important to you. Yeah. I'm going to shift this light over just a little bit. So I'm not like, okay. yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, sure. it's, it's very dramatic looking over here. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure it's really working for the conversation. I like it. Totally like a cool. Bond villain. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm trying to get away from that Bond villain vibe. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, we got to show a new Josh Trank to the internet. Let's go. Um, yeah. Yeah. Show, let's show them a whole new Josh Trank. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Yeah, if you want to finish up with one more question. Yeah, that yeah. Are you sure you want to do have I have I driven everybody crazy yet? No, oh, not at all. No, no, this is great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for doing this. Um yeah, of course. I think Sabrina wanted to finish up this conversation with a question. Yep. Yeah. So we're five years out from Fantastic Four, and I still think it's a really great example of the landscape of online criticism and social media. Yeah. Um, anonymity creates an environment where people now have the ability to contact you with like any unfiltered thoughts, any criticism, and you know you could also reach back to them in a matter of seconds. Um, right. so what are your thoughts about the incorporation of online criticism, social media? and kind of the influence it has to a filmmaker's process. Um, do you take what you see online into account when you're working on something new or when you're reflecting on a past project? It changes minute to minute for me. I know everybody has a different relationship like with the, with the internet. I think this is like, I'll use, um, what's the guy's name? He's not a filmmaker, but I thought it was an interesting analogy or analogous situation was uh, the creator of No Man's Sky, the video game. Do you remember that game that came out a few years ago and it was basically being promoted as like this, like, you know, um, it was going to ch change video games forever. And it was, you know, you're uh, uh, playing a, you know, uh, this anonymous character, whoever you see this character as, this character being you, you have a spaceship and there are trillions of procedurally generated planets that you are free to travel to and discover. And every single planet has its own ecosystem and its own um, uh, biology and uh uh, animals and creatures to be discovered. And just the idea of that alone is like, it's groundbreaking in your mind. Like what the fuck? Like, wait, I can go to these planets and how big are they? The actual size of planets. So this was when, when the, uh, the concept of this game was um, dropped by uh, the companies called Hello Games. Um, by it, just a small indie company, and it's like five, 10 people or something like that. Um, people were on the edge of their seats. I mean, Kanye West, uh, he was on some uh, talk show, late night show, and he was talking about it. Like everybody was talking about it for a moment. And uh, it got all this heat to the point where like Sony bought the exclusive rights to debut that on uh, PlayStation before everybody else. And so the the Reddit community, the Twitter community, and, and the creator of the game, he was on Twitter the entire time interacting with fans. And there was all of this hype and expectation on the game and what it was going to be. And he started doing these demos and he was talking about all these features, like you could build these bases and create all these things and do all this stuff. The game drops and like literally 80% of the shit that he was talking about was not there. Whoa. And people flipped the fuck out uh, and just were just like bombing the game on all the ratings. And like people were like wanted to kill this guy. And this happened about maybe four or five months after Fantastic Four came out. And I was watching all this happen and my heart was just broken for this guy. Yeah. Because I just kept thinking to myself like I, I – started rewatching these videos of him, his, the interviews of the lead up and, and the um, uh, times that he would go, he went on Stephen Colbert and like demoed it for Stephen Colbert. And I was watching him and I saw something that i that was very familiar to me, which was somebody who's just scared shitless of the fact that like he was 
He had to be on board with this big corporation and talking about features that he knew were not going to be ready yet, but at some point down the line, they would be updated and implemented into the, into the game, into the software. But they had to sell the game on, on the promise that, that the software developers had been dreaming of. And there were some voices that were basically, um, you know, it, like wiser voices that were saying, you know, everybody needs to leave these guys alone instead of harassing them and, and trying to tear them apart every second online. Like, look at what they created. They literally did give you guys uh, an entire virtual universe where there are trillions of planets and they will be updating it over the years. But, you know, the, the marketing expectation on it is was the lie and it was the lie that they all had to sign up for in order to get the funding to get their their product out there and now to this day like my friends kids are picking up no man's sky for the first time they they don't have that history with the game that i remember of it coming out and people freaking out they're discovering this game for the first time and it's been updated to it today it includes all of the stuff that they were promising years ago that it didn't have and kids are picking up and it's like the best game they've ever played in their lives. Like it, it's doing all those things. And if you look at, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is like when we focus too much on like what fan feedback is in the moment, if you let that affect you too much, like it's such a wasted energy, you know, people are going to be like, like you don't know who these people really are. You know, it's a lot of anonymous avatars and like people with anime faces on their, yeah. <laughs> their you know, on their Twitter uh, accounts. And, you know, like I try to just pretend because I get hate all the time. I get rage tweets. Every time I tweet anything, I got people a little fan for stick, you know, and it's it's fine. Like it is what it is. Or stop making movies. Sometimes it affects me. Sometimes I want to say something. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I go, no. You know, I did that a few days ago because it's sort of like, it does get annoying sometimes, but also it can be very beautiful because I will get tweets or DMs from people who will write me these really well thought out things where like just wanting to let me know how either Chronicle or Capone affected them or they watched it with their father or something like that. And if it were not for that relationship with the internet, I wouldn't be able to get those kinds of messages and interactions that are actually very beautiful. So it's a mixed bag, you know? And I mean, for the creator of No Man's Sky, why I bring that up is just like five years ago, he must have wanted to kill himself. And today I'm sure like, you know, it's such a different thing. And I mean, I, I, I'm sure he thinks about this all the time, like his relationship with social media and with the internet, cause like, now all of a sudden I'm sure all he gets is just great feedback from people who are like, this is the best game I've ever played. I've logged in 500 hours and I've, you know, discovered an entire, you know, race of aliens on this planet that were procedurally generated and people are making discoveries that like could have never ex existed anywhere else, you know? So it's, it's, it's a hard one. I mean, I think filmmakers and creators and, and all of you guys too, like struggle with that every day, you know, people are going to pick you apart because you're doing things that might not fall in line with the way that they think they would want to be doing it, you know, but you can't please everybody. I mean, Marilyn Manson had a really good quote and I'm paraphrasing it, but he's like, if you're making something, making something for everybody, um, what is it? He said, uh, um, making something for everybody, uh, isn't worth making at all. You know, like it, you'll have, you'll have to look that one up. I think he said it on like Bill O'Reilly or something like that. Cause he was trying <laughs> to someone fact check. Yeah. Somebody <laughs> please fact check me, but he said something to that, you know, along those lines. And I, I remember just, it's so true, you know, like, the way that you want to, the way that you, you, what your message is and the way that you want to deliver your message has to be personal and from you. And it might not connect with everybody. But, if, but if you try to give that message to people in a way that you think is going to connect with everybody, you're just shooting down the middle and it's not, it's, 
going to be forgettable and it's not going to be meaningful. Sometimes you have to, if you, some, um, most of the time, if you're going to say something coming from a place of complete honesty, you are going to offend other people and going to make them insecure. Even if it's not a mean spirited thing that you have to say, you could be saying the most kind spirited thing in the most honest way. And it's going to freak people out. It's going to make people insecure. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, again, thank you so much, man. We're going to take a quick break. After the break, we're going to get into Capone slash Fonzo. Uh, so make sure you guys stick around. Stick around. This ain't funny, so don't you dare laugh. With the 450 divide you in half. You getting at me equals a club half. You do the math. Check out our review of the new HBO film, Bad Education, starring Hugh Jackman. Available exclusively on First Cut. Enjoy. Hey, Sabrina, you just finished it. I want to have your, your hot yeah. take right now. <laughs> hot take? I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, I believe his name is Corey, Corey Finley. Has impressed me both with Thoroughbreds and this one. Um, I think he's a really cool, interesting filmmaker to look out for. I don't know if he's done any other stuff I'd be, uh, be familiar with, but I think I really enjoyed both. I love the performances. I love the ensemble. That was probably like my favorite part. Even a lot of the supporting cast who like weren't really in it for as long and uh, stuff like that. I think they all kind of made a big splash. And of course, Hugh Jackman is incredible. I think I am not that I'm happy that he's not Wolverine anymore, but I'm happy that we can get performances like this out of him as well. That kind of are like something different out of that as much as I loved him as Wolverine. And uh, yeah, Allison Janney is always always great every single thing she does like she could literally you know what i want her to be president i want to vote that's my hot take i want allison janney to be president because she is a baddie i was i was gonna say bad b but i'm a censor myself so i'll just say baddie come along children now we're going to have a little music What is up, guys? We're back with Josh Trank, and now we're going to get into Capone, a movie that just recently released on Video On Demand. Uh, we briefly touched upon the whole idea of Video On Demand and the whole theatrical structure kind of being expedited into the future of what seems to be streaming. Obviously, we just had the release of HBO Max. Uh, Peacock is coming out later on. Uh, I, I kind of want to touch a little bit on that just because we already did, but just... I still can't get over the fact, first of all, that um, eventually we're going to hit a stream where theaters are slowly going out of business. And it's happening now, especially with COVID-19. Um, but obviously, man, this is something that you would have loved to have seen in theaters, right? I'm assuming right. so. Yeah. I mean, it's our deal. Um, uh, vertical came in uh, Yeah, at the end of... February, beginning of March, and the deal was to make a uh, theatrical release around this time between 300 to 500 screens. And uh, the only concession that I had to make was just to change the title from Fonzo to Capone, but that it would be my final cut. So, I mean, I was, I was over the moon. And then it was like quite literally, I think a week and a half later or something like that, where it, it the reality set in that there was it, this is we're entering a global pandemic with impending lockdowns and um i just kind of i mean i think what how we all reacted to it it's like whatever any of our plans are are completely put on hold no matter what which was an interesting equalizer where it, like i didn't feel that freaked out about the fate of the movie because i'm just like what the fuck is the fate of the world at this point so yeah right I, so when they told me kind of at the last minute, just really, I guess a month ago that we were just going to go straight to the OD, I felt just grateful and relieved that, you know, there's just people trapped up in their apartments with like, you know, 10 family members just like watching Hulu on their phones going crazy. And the idea that I could give them something new to watch, even if it's not their cup of tea, it, at least to provide some interesting conversation for people to have about something that isn't just focused on the terror of uh, you yeah. know, viral death. So, yeah. And the idea too, that 
now it's kind of a different atmosphere where Netflix obviously is rising in stock and people are discovering movies and having success in movies on video yeah. on demand. So if anything, I mean, it's discovering a new success, right? It's actually a big hit. Capone has reached a larger audience and people are watching it. People are talking about it. How yeah. does that feel? Just having a reaction to it. It's interesting. I mean, yeah, this was the kind of movie that I intended as a, if, if I had my um, fantasy football sort of control over the situation, it would be, you know, it's a movie called Fonzo and it would uh, hit a small audience that would see a trailer for a movie called Fonzo starring Tom Hardy, where it's all this fucking weird shit is happening and he's got a carrot in his mouth for some reason and it's got this sort of off-putting sense of humor and people who would see it sort of like, the first time I saw the trailer for Bronson, that trailer wasn't for everybody when it first came out back in yeah. 2009. You know, like I saw that trailer, I'm like, this movie looks like it was made for me. And I want, that's what I was trying to do here was make a movie that like, there would be a small portion of people who would latch onto this trailer and be like, I don't know, I don't care about the rest of my plan, my friends, I'm canceling my own plans because this that movie's for me. And then they would go see it in one of their smaller theaters or something. Like that was what I saw the movie as being. I didn't, uh, I didn't see it in my mind as a movie that would be a mainstream disruptor. Sure. Um, I saw it as a film that would f find its small audience and then by word of mouth, would grow and more people would be like, hey, you have to see this movie while it's still in theaters. Like it's fucking crazy. You like, you, but you have to go to the theater to see it. That was my dream. Um, but that's not how it played out. It, they, it's called Capone and it's starring Tom Hardy and it was on the front page of everybody's VOD applications. And a lot of people have seen it. And, yes. and the conversations are heated. And I love it. I mean, it's not what I expected, but it's a great, it's great because I think the movie is also, you know, it's, it's for every person who might've seen it that like just either doesn't get it or this kind of cinema is not for them. There are also a lot of people who are seeing this movie um, who might not have ever seen it, who appreciate it and maybe are going to be more interested in seeing more slow paced, deliberately off-putting, you know, uh, um, uh, oddball cinema, like what, you know, what I'm into and what a lot of my friends are into. So it's, it's been, it's been interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's something I find super interesting because just seeing the reaction has been so passionate, whether whichever direction it's in, it's super passionate. And, um, you mentioned the title change and I think, yeah. The title you guys ended up with is really interesting because this film does deconstruct the myth of Al Capone. And it's more of an intimate display of this notorious man kind of ignoring his heyday and showing him like plagued with neurosyphilis, haunted by yeah. his past and having to confront it. Um, so what made you decide to tell this specific story of Al Capone? So the answer is frustratingly self-indulgent. So I'll try not to um, you know, take five hours to tell it, but you know, uh, we touched a little bit on what I went through in making Fantastic Four, um, sort of the, um, what the success, the, the runaway success of Chronicle, what that brought into my life. Um, I went from just sleeping on my mom's couch in Culver City uh, to having three hour meetings with Tom Cruise at his house and like, uh, engaging with the biggest, most high-profile movies in the in our in our biz in the business, and um, so uh, I went from that to dead silence and being essentially blackballed and considered uh, being labeled toxic. So um, in the sort of months-long stretch following the release of Fantastic Four, I was a good 60, 70 pounds overweight. Uh, my health was, uh, physical health was just bad. Uh, I was chain smoking two packs a day of cigarettes and I was just sitting outside just feeling numb and reflecting obsessively 
over all like the glory days, so to speak, that were not that far behind me. Um, because the 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 shutoff was so instantaneous from like 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 that 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 that, that to just quiet. And at one point I just started to, I don't know why, but I had read years prior about Al Capone and uh, the years after he was released from Alcatraz. And this image just started popping into my head every day. It was just from smoking a lot of weed and smoking a lot of cigarettes and just thinking about nothing, just zenned out meditatively. And I kept thinking about this image uh, that I had seen of Al Capone sitting outside in his backyard with a cigar in his mouth, looking gaunt and uh, crazy. And I was thinking like, what the fuck? Like, what was he, what was it like for him sitting there in eerie silence, reflecting on his glory days? And, and what would it feel like for him to be haunted by um, a lot of the trauma from his past in, in a moment to moment way, because I was uh, in a lot of counseling for, for, a, for a lot of things. I was, it had insomnia. Um, I had this crazy feeling where I was so used to talking to so many people throughout the day for a good five years straight of like being on the phone and going into production meetings with like 200 people and, ta and just talking to people all day long, surrounded by people, and then just nobody around me. And I still heard the fucking voices of all those people every day in the silence. And it was like, I kept asking myself, like, am I going fucking crazy? Is this what crazy feels like? And so as a way of feel being comforted, because I just started to think about like, well, what would it have been like for Al Capone? Well, way worse. Because I mean, I wasn't, my memories didn't involve people getting hacked up and shot in the face, you know? Like it was, so as, as a way for me to sort of emotionally resolve what I was going through, I just stepped inside of that. Every morning I woke up, it gave me something to look forward to, to step outside of my own skin and what I was feeling and go inside of Al Capone in that time of his life and just know that writing about the end of Al Capone's life was a reminder that this wasn't the end of my life, but a beginning of the next chapter of my life, not to be too pretentious, but that's, that's what it made me feel, you know? Yeah. So that, that's why I ultimately chose to write about this. Yeah. yeah. No. And you could see, like, you could see a lot of that through the filmmaking and through the um, techniques that you use through like this kind of blend of like, realism and surrealism and like you know what's real and what's fake the kind of unreliable narrator traits that you kind of see throughout this film i think are just incredibly interesting and, and kind of bold um my next question would be you know with with films that subvert and and uh de demythologize or de demythologize the the gangster and the crime movie genre like you know the irishman and like uncut gems and like your film capone uh, do you think we're kind of entering like a new era of like crime films where we're kind of looking at these notorious criminals from like a different perspective? I think it's uh, a question of just sort of to what we were talking about uh, earlier um, about the sort of the focus on uh, the filmmaker versus the brand or the franchise or anything like that. And how from what I've experienced or seen in the last three decades has been a sort of, it, it changes every few years and we're, we're sort of revisited by um, ideas like revisionist cinema. So mm -hmm. revisionist cinema in the 1960s was a big deal. So you had like, there's a, a filmmaker who's one of my favorite filmmakers named Monty Hellman, um, who struggled for many, many years um, because his movies were just, you know, antag and almost antagonistic to the audience in a lot of ways and taking ideas that they were very comfortable with, but turning them upside down. Like these are not movies that are necessarily made to please an audience, but to challenge an audience. People will embrace that and be stimulated by it or they will become angry and walk away from it. And that's what I wanted to make with this film. So when people are saying like, this movie is boring, I'm just like, good. <laughs> Cause that was the point of this film. It's deliberately off-putting it is deliberately antagonistic to the audience in the way that life is 
but by taking a genre such as the gangster genre that has uh, an appeal to it and then making a version of that movie that is questioning every angle of that appeal is the heart of revisionist cinema. So Monty Hellman, who I adore, um, he made a lot of revisionist Westerns like Ride in the Whirlwind, which is a film starring Jack Nicholson. And it is this purely existential Western that uh, plays off of a lot of the traditional tropes of a Western, but plays it into this sort of spiritual existential journey that one person could watch it and say, this fucking movie was about nothing. But at the same time, I could watch it. And to me, it's about everything. Yeah. You know, um, or Tulane Blacktop, which is his revisionist take on the road film or the the car movie, which he made in the early 70s. That's it's it's just revisionist cinema. And we haven't really seen had a lot of revisionist cinema lately because we've been living in an era of populism, um, which, you know, the result of that is a perfect. Donald Trump is a great example. I mean, populism breeds populist figures and populist cinema. Um, when people want, you know, when people, uh, when populism is is the mainstream, that's when you have these brand centric sort of uh, movies that um, sort of fall in line with like the audience wants it because it's it's what they enjoy and people want to enjoy things and it's fun and this is what movies should be. But I hope and I think that in the next five or six years, we're gonna see more filmmakers kind of tearing down that status quo, whether it's through the choices of narrative that they approach or the diversity or however it is that they're, they're going about it. And the best thing being the fact that uh, technology wise, our cameras and our tools that um, we normally associate with filmmaking are much more accessible than they've ever been before. Anybody can pick up a uh, you know, camera with a small skeleton crew and with a microphone and some actors and make any fucking movie they desire. Um, and I hope that more people feel compelled to do that, especially when once we're able to sort of get out of this pandemic. Um, and rather than just making cinema to appease an audience, I would love to see more movies that are being put out there to challenge the audience. And it's it should be okay to make a movie that isn't for everybody, rather than having a movie where it's like, if this doesn't matter, if this, if the consensus isn't a hundred percent or 80% to 90%, your shit is trash. Like that is anti-art, it's anti-cinema and it's how ideas die. It's how interesting ideas work their way into the minds of young people who could some might someday change the world or do this better than I could ever do this. You know, I, I by no means think that I'm uh, the uh, great or the greatest. I just know that I'm doing exactly what I want to do the way that I want to do it and that it's going to speak to certain people in a way that's going to make them uh, feel challenged to go get up and go do their way of doing it. And as somebody who just lives and breathes movies, that's all I want. I want more people to be doing this. Well, well kind of going off that real quick, I, I want to talk about a little bit about what I started with up top and the idea of what you're saying, the idea of what RB3 and I have been debating for the past three years since we started this podcast is his idea of what streaming can give to young creators and audiences were now... Right. Uh, studios can say, you know what, we weren't going to invest this movie, but now that we can toss it on streaming, let's give this guy a $30 million budget. He's a young and up and coming filmmaker and let him do his movie. And my counter to that with RB3, he would say, I would say, yeah, but we can't see that in theaters, which is a bummer. And right. the only thing we get in theaters is those four quadrant movies and those blockbuster type movies. Do you, do you see like a positive or a negative with, with, seen a rise maybe with creators and diverse creators but but mainly going to streaming versus kind of the four quadrant movies going to theaters i think that i think there's benefits to to both sides of that you know okay. like it, it's it's really it dip it every every creator every filmmaker is going to have their own path 
you know, it's it's the it goes back to the sort of the James Cameron or the Ron Howard thing. And in this new world where we're talking about um, uh, consumer platforms that exist now that didn't exist 30 years ago in the time when James Cameron or Ron Howard were young filmmakers, um, you know, you're going to have you're going to have different points of views and different perspectives that are going to be telling their stories and how their filmography um, plays into uh, their business making skills or their business making decisions, because that's a big part of, of this game, which is you are entering a business world where people with money and properties and access to um, distribution are going to come knocking down your door with offers that are hard to refuse. Especially considering the fact that like, once you start climbing out of the, the, the weirdness that is your 20s, you know, like you, you gotta make a living, you know, like you, you have to be able to like, you know, you might wanna set up a life for yourself. So you kind of have to consider like, okay, well, you know what, maybe if I just like go, if you know, you're like, find yourself in a position where somebody is willing to throw down a check for, you know, pay you $2 million to direct a movie, like, it's worth considering, you know, like, that's, that's where it's like, where we're talking about from the outset of it as fans of the of the art that is being made and the movies that are being made versus being in the shoes of somebody where, you know, they're having to consider, okay, well, my skills and my storytelling have gotten me to a place where people with real money want to give me an opportunity to do something where I could maybe go buy a house. Yeah. And set up a life for myself and maybe have a fan start a family, you know, like those, those that, that plays into it in a big way. And I mean, I'm coming from a place where, you know, I've, I've had, I've had the biggest opportunities handed to me, period. Like if you only knew the numbers on like my Star Wars deal, it it was it's it just made no sense. I would be good for five lifetimes had that all played out the way that maybe it could have played out. But based off of my own the way that I felt about going about things back then, it was to risk those opportunities because I felt it was more important to risk those opportunities than to um, uh, just like embrace the money and be like, okay, well, I'll compromise everything to just like get to, to get this money. Like money has not always been a driving factor for me. It's been about, you know, uh, being uncompromising, but at the same time, it has fucked up my wallet pretty badly. And you know, for instance, on Capone, Bonzo, I mean, I cut most of my fees as a writer. My writing fee, my directing fee, and my editing fee are all separate. And I cut my editing fee entirely. I cut a good portion of my directing fee and a good portion of my writing fee to put it back into production so that I could afford things like a rain machine or another day of shooting. Because when you look at the schedule breakdown, every single day costs like $200,000 or $250,000. And it's like, well, if I can just cut some of my fee, it's worth it to me as a risk to put it back into there so that I can have another day of shooting, you know? But at the same time, these are, that's, that's where art starts to come into collision with the artist's business making decisions. So I don't, I, if that's the best, if that answers the question. Yeah, totally. Yeah, definitely. And that kind of actually was uh, getting into my next question. So I mentioned that you wrote, directed, and edited this film, taking on a lot of roles and sacrificing a lot to get it made. Um, why did you decide to wear all those has hats? Was it like the less positive experience you've had in the past? Or did it was it the push to get this film made and to kind of stay true to your own art? Well, uh, quite simply, I knew that with this movie, um, I wanted to avoid, um, 
I wanted to avoid mirroring a template of another type of a movie. So for instance, with Chronicle, it was easy to not have to wear all of those hats in terms of like also being the editor. Although at first I wanted to be the editor, but the studio was like, this is a big studio and that's too indie, you know? So they, mm. they like to separate it a little bit, but it was easier to do that because the, um, the editing was just right there in the pacing of the, of the script and the story because of the way like this scene plays out and then it's cut to the next scene. So that was like the editing, right? Mm -hmm. So the editing basically happened while shooting. But on this movie, this is a film that I needed to find myself in my own editorial journey that required me to be very far away from the industry, as far away as possible. So I spent about a year and a half living in the woods in upstate New York in my own personal quarantine for, um, I mean, I go months without seeing anybody, just me and my dog. And I mean, it was a crazy experience. Like I definitely was like my, like heart of darkness type of deal. Um, but in a way that I just needed to like be alone with that thing and exercise some demons. You know, like, so when you're seeing that movie, it's like, it, it, it's it's gonna live for obviously a very long time. And I know that like what's out there is a very, very raw expression of how I felt. So when I talk about sort of like an antagonistic, um, uh, an antagonistic relationship with the viewer, you know, that that's intentional. If things are off putting, that's intentional. It's, it's meant to sort of, uh, challenge the audience, like, are you still with us? And if you're not, feel free to leave. You know, yeah. you can leave at any moment, that, you know? So that, and that's kind of how I feel about life in general. So there's a lot packed into that movie that might not make sense for a long time to a lot of people, but like, that's the kind of film I wanted to make that even people who love the movie can maybe pick it up again in two years from now and then watch it again. And it'll mean something totally different to them. I mean, movies are really meant to be uh, uh, absorbed after 10 or 20 years, you know, long past, you know, like, like I'll, I'll be, you know, gray and fried by, by the point, I think somebody who will actually go do something with their own life based off of this movie will actually exist. I may never meet that person, but that's just sort of what it is. So as far as just like putting on all the hats, I knew that this was the time for me to do that. So I could establish this and make this movie in this way where I was cutting all of these fees like I was talking about and doing it in this style because I will not be able to afford to get this kind of movie made on the, in these conditions ever again. I mean, yeah. going forward, making movies and making, you know, uh, working on series and stuff like that, like I made this movie this way so that I didn't have to ever do it again. You know, I'm happy after this, like, if, if some studio wants to work with me on something, they're engaging with me on honest terms because they know what I do. Yeah, You know, if they wanna make something with me, there's going to be no question as to what my sensibilities are because it's right there. So th so I'll know like you, they really fuck with me if they, if they wanna fuck with me, you know? And, and I know RB3 had some editing questions as well because he also uh, focuses on being on writer, director, editor for his short film. So RB3, uh, Bring it out, man. Oh, yeah. I just had a quick question. I mean, you already kind of touched on a lot of like what post-production life looked like. You're editing. You said in, in New York you, you're talking about. Uh, so, you were, so did you edit like from home and did you have like a whole setup and, and yeah. did you have like an assistant editor and a team and stuff like that? No. It's oh, just wow. wow. Okay. My, you met my assistant editor at the beginning. You do. <laughs> yeah. Eugene. 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 What a sweet, what a sweetheart. Yeah. Um, I'll send you guys uh, the picture of the what my editing setup looked at, looked like at home. I mean, it was oh, cool. it was really cool. Like I there's a whole world in upstate New York that I didn't know existed. Um, because uh, LP who scored the film, uh, I spent the first uh three and a half months of editing actually at uh, LP's kind of compound up there. Um, obviously I'd never say where, but like, you know, he's got a spot. Um, and so I was there with L and, um, uh, and with Wilder and some of the dudes up there who they work with. Um, and it was just like creative camp for a few months, you know, like me just making my, my rough cut and just throwing scenes over to L who was like in the next room where he's got this like 
dope studio that he built from scratch and like all of his wow. like you're into synths and shit like that like i mean i'm like really have this like obsession with with just synths and old analog synths and stuff like that and lp is somebody who i've been man let me tell you something like lp is like my on my mount rushmore like of just lifelong influences like i've been listening to lp since i was like like 16 years old or something like that and his music and and if you want to by the way like it's something um i really haven't talked about too much um uh, and i'm sorry for uh these deep conversational detours is just kind of like where i go but um if you listen to fantastic damage lp's first solo album came out in the early 2000s if you listen to that album it is exactly what i'm talking about in terms of deliberately antagonistic inaccessible art that is meant to polarize and hone in specifically on a specific artistic audience that will a thousand percent understand it but other people will be like what am i listening to mm -hmm. but if you if it's for your ears you hear the you hear the universe in 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 every layer of what's going on in there so LP's production style and his aesthetic and how it's evolved from where it's where he started out as an artist trying to make a statement with every song and with every album to what he's doing now with Run the Jewels with Killer Mike. It's it's a whole evolution of artistry. And that that to me is like he's one of my biggest heroes for that reason. So to be able to 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 get together with LP, who has shown me so much love over the last fucking five years now like he's been some really really close person in my life who you know i reached out to him halfway through the whole fantastic four experience because like i said he was one of my lifelong uh idols and i always dreamt of one day working with him and that he would score something a movie that i would make so i used my opportunity during fantastic four to reach out to l who had just they had just made run the jewels 2 it had been out for a couple of months and uh, and and we kind of linked up over that, and he ended up doing the end credits theme for Fantastic Four, which he he tweeted out today. And I, I'd go listen to that it, w whenever you guys have a chance, because I mean, it's really, really, it's the one thing actually from Fantastic Four that was like the good thing that was in there, the way it was meant to be. But anyway, <laughs> that time that I spent to just talk about editorial a little bit in a way that I think is kind of interesting because it's a, it's it's. A very atypical of, a, of how you would normally edit a movie where um, usually you edit a film um, and you know you'll have a composer involved like on some level but typically you like you edit the movie and you cut in temp score and stuff and I have an aversion to temp score and it's just a personal thing it doesn't mean everybody should and I think that that's something that people should just be aware of like when somebody's talking about a personal preference of how they approach their art that's not saying everybody should do it it's just what makes sense for them so I I just don't like to use temp score I like to cut dry to just look like just drink it drink in this every scene and, and let it play out with just you know nothing or diegetic sound or something you know mm -hmm. so Anyway, um, like I tried out this approach with L that he and I had been talking about for a few years leading up to this when he knew I was writing this movie that if I ever made it, what I would do is have him involved with the editing process right from the beginning so that his artistic process that I've always been inspired by could sort of bond with mine a little bit in that exploratory sense of collaboration. Mm -hmm. So while I was cutting scenes, rough scenes that were playing longer than, you know, you, you know, that's what you gotta do at first, just play them out long. I would be kicking over those sequences to L in the studio in the next room and he wouldn't have it, he wouldn't know what he was about to see and then he'd watch it through and then he would fuck with that scene for like, you know, a few days or something like that. And he'd be like, yo, check this out over in the studio. I want you to want to know what you think of this. And I'd go in there and we'd watch that. And it would just be like, there's never a wrong answer about anything with that kind of art, which is sort of the way of working with Tom Hardy too. Like nobody is ever wrong. We're just trying shit out. If you fall, you fall, we all pick each other up, you know? So 
that that process was extended into editing in a way that was not normal. It wasn't typical, but we were given the room to be able to do that, which was really dope. So uh, I spent a good couple of months over there uh, working with him and the guys. And then I started to realize just how kind of interesting upstate New York was. And then I was like, I wondered how much, cause I was supposed to come back to LA after just a few months over there and then just like, you know, get the process going with them. And then we would just start finalizing it. But I looked into Zillow of like how much it, how, how much rent would cost around there. I'm just like, fuck it. What if I just stayed up here? Like, I don't need to go. Like, what if I just didn't want to go back to LA? What about that? You know? So <laughs> I looked at Zillow and my, I could not believe how inexpensive rent is up there for like places that are on like acres, like acres wow. of land. And I found the spot that was like 20 acres, had two houses and a barn. Wow. I mean, I'm from LA. I don't know what it's like to have a barn. And I, but for me, this was so interesting. It'd be such an interesting little spiritual journey, you know, like an interesting part of Fonzo. So, um, and it was just like, I mean, it was, it was like a quarter of, of the, it, it's like half of the rent of a normal apartment in like West LA was basically what I spent on that. And so I just moved in there with my dog and, you know, the only down, the only um, bad part about it is that, you know, you're about 30 to 40 minutes away from a grocery store, mm. nobody around, there's no yeah. civilization. And it's like a little bit like horror movie vibes at night, but you know, so anyway, that's where I was just for a good year and a half, but it was a just deep exploratory editorial process. And I would say like for anybody, if you have the opportunity as a filmmaker to be able to engage with something like that, do it because you're going to learn so much about yourself. You're going to learn so much about your own footage. You know, like I think every director should have a lot of experience as an editor so that they could really, really understand what kind of footage they want in the first place. You know, um, it's an interesting process, but I don't want to do that again. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. So. Um, I, I kind of want to finish up here and obviously I'll, I'll let RB3 and Sabrina. Yeah, RB3 okay. and Sabrina, whenever you want to guys toss in any question you want. Uh, but I, I'm just curious because you keep talking about art that, that, kind of can influence a single person or art that's not necessarily for everyone, all for a quadrant. Uh, and that's something that I think each of us appreciate as well. Do, do you keep up with film? Do you have any favorites over the past recent years? Because um, obviously we love to celebrate movies and any weird movies that you recommend or any movies that you like a lot? Well, I mean, I don't know if anybody's seen Mandy, but that's yeah, a cool yeah. of what I'm talking about. And I love the fuck out of that movie. Yeah. I've seen it, I've seen it like 30 times. Like I just love I love that movie. I love Panos's movies. Uh Beyond the Black Rainbow. If you haven't seen that, that's his first movie. Oh, I saw it when that I saw that movie when it first came out. It fucked me up. It's again, that one is definitely not for everybody either, but if it's for you, it will inspire you to want to make movies. Like it is just great. It's so interesting. It's so distinct. Um yeah, uh, what? but what else? I mean, I've pretty much seen the last five years has been off and on because I haven't, uh, I've been focused a lot on what I've been doing, but I've been sure. catching up recently on a lot of things. Um, what did I really love recently? You know, what's a great series is uh, that I didn't expect and it just blew me away was, uh, that was so interesting and different, it was uh, Homecoming with Julia Roberts. Yeah, oh, yeah. Sam RB3 Ismael. likes that. Did you see that? Yeah, I did. Yeah, Great, yeah. right. I haven't, I haven't seen season two yet, but um, I yeah, I that saw the trailer. It looks incredible. It, it's amazing. Like at first, you think is it's like you see the synopsis, and it's just like this is going to be some like I don't know, just some like just psychologists and PTSD soldiers. It is like not that. It's yeah. so wild. It's so interesting and artistic and and bold. Um, oh God, what have I? What have I seen? Uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, seen I've seen some shit uh, recently. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, uh, Under the Silver Lake, which I know is the- Oh, there you go. 
Sabrina's, which is, yep. uh, I wanted to see that when it came out, but uh, I'm a big fan of uh, David uh, uh, Mitchell. Right. I, I kind of wanted to avoid, I sort of try to avoid seeing movies that um, are new or might be doing specific things so that I'm not too cross influenced by it. Yeah. It's just a personal choice. Not everybody has to do that, but um, I fucking love that movie, especially having grown up uh, in all the different parts of LA. I mean, before I graduated high school, we moved like over uh, like 15 times or something. So I got to live in different areas of the city. And to me, LA is such as like an odd place because you can't really define it by a neighborhood. It's all air, different areas with weird shit going on. It's, and I just felt like it, it was a very authentic, it felt very authentic to a certain aspect of LA that I haven't really seen explored like that before. And I was just fully engrossed in it. And I just loved it. Just, I had no idea what was going to happen. I love unpredictable movies, yeah. um, loved uncut gems. Um, yeah. obviously I'm a huge Safety Brothers fan. I love Good Time. Um, uh, yeah, but God, no, I know there's some, I know there's some like super mainstream stuff that I've seen recently that I also love. Like, I'm not like, like my taste is, my taste is like all over the place. So, I mean, it's not like I'm just out here consuming, you know, uh, weirdo cinema and stuff like that. Only like, I just, I kind of like everything. Um, sure. but at the same time, like, I'm not going to immediately, like, again, I'd rather rewatch uh, Barton Fink, you know, 45,000 times, which is, that's one of my favorite movies of all time, if not my favorite. Brilliant. Um, and I like, I'll watch that movie four times a day before I'm going to like check out anything else, like, just because that's my comfort zone and I just want to live in that space sometimes, but. Yeah, the, Barn Fink is literally one of my favorite Coen Brothers movies. Really? So yeah, like okay, I we're like best friends. Though. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> movie's so good, so totally Hollywood good. too. Okay, well then we need to just do a whole thing where we'll do an episode just talk about that movie because nobody talks about that movie ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is the most accurate. It, it is so accurate of mm -hmm. Hollywood in the craziest ways. It's mm -hmm. I love that movie so much, man. Yeah. I haven't seen it yet, but I'll definitely have to check it out. Oh, you'll love it. It's so yeah. dope. Yeah, it's great. It's it's just, it's also one of these movies too, where you don't know at a certain point, it doesn't matter what's real and what's not because it's all in this like sort of, you know, like, I, can't, I don't want to ruin anything, but all I'll say is John Goodman is like. <laughs> John Goodman. There are some scenes with John Goodman in that movie where I swear, I swear you see God in his eyes. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like there's something so powerful inside of this man that I cannot describe with words. Um, yeah. But it's an amazing movie, uh, but not for everybody. It's a movie. A lot of people I've shown that movie to a lot of friends over the years and people are just kind of like, was it, is it supposed to be funny? Am I supposed to be laughing right now? I don't get it. Is it a comedy? <laughs> no, I get that 100% because I, I've been talking about Under the Silver Lake for the past year and I'm like, you might not like it and I'm sorry right. if you don't, but like I really do and it's okay, right. everything's subjective. Um, yeah, and that's the, the same way I feel about Capone. I mean, it was one of those, it's like this year's Under the Silver Lake for me where I'm so intrigued by a movie and I'm so fascinated by a movie from all different aspects from like technical standpoint. And another thing, like as a writer, um, I was I was just curious how you kind of evolved as a writer over the years to take on this script alone. Um, mm -hmm. What have you learned from your experience writing Capone that you'll kind of take forward with you in your career? Um, so it's, it's a really good question because I don't I haven't figured out the answer yet. I'm still trying to figure that out every day. Like as I'm writing new things, I mean, I just know that like every story that you want to tell is coming from a different side of you, maybe, I don't know, maybe some people, the stories are coming from the same place. It's, it's different for, for every writer. Um, uh, for me, I, I just know that if I try to re, if I try to recreate the conditions or the enthusiasm or the schedule that uh, Fonzo was birthed out of, um, 
it would be impossible, you know? Like, all, all I know is the one thing that that I really did learn from Fonzo, uh, from writing it, I'm sorry, Capone, um, still getting used to calling it that, um, is that um, I, I'm better when I don't outline things. Um, I, I like to surprise myself, like, I, I, I want, I, I don't wanna know what's gonna happen next. And in all the times that I've tried to outline, um, I find myself kind of just writing through the motions when I'm then going into the writing stage of it after outlining. Because if an idea or a plot point that I like beat it out into an outline was exciting to me in the moment, I may be writing a scene that suddenly alters the course of the rest of that story halfway through the script and makes those other plot points not work anymore. And then I'll be caught up in this headspace of being like, well, am I gonna try to like bend the story back into that roadmap that I had set out for myself? And then that becomes an issue, uh, you know, that becomes an issue in, that, that um, just creates problems for me. So I don't know, some people it's like better to outline. And I guess also too, like it just depends on the environment that you're working in. Like if I was working in a writer's room with a bunch of people, I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd be able to get away with that shit. I think I'd definitely have to be outlining stuff because you're working with a bunch of other people. So it's a little bit different, but I don't know. I've never done the writer's room experience. I don't know. Maybe I, I, I wouldn't be right for that. I'm not sure. But yeah. I mean, just for me, it, it's uh, yeah. So uh, the one thing that I do know is to just sort of like uh, make sure to just like write every single day as a, um, as a commitment to what you're doing, even if you're not feeling it, just try to spend at least two to three hours a day just writing and don't be overly conscious about what it is that you're writing. Don't don't go back and reread the same pages all the time and try to make something perfect as you're writing it. Leave it sloppy and just get to the end. That's that, that's what I learned from it. So yeah, I love that. Um, I, I kind of want to finish up um, uh, with RB3. I know RB3 uh, had a question as well, and then we can wrap up uh, just so we're not here all night. <laughs> yeah. uh, but otherwise, we appreciate I, you, I man. Warned, I warned you guys I could talk. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> amazing. It's been amazing so far. RB3, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to finish up with this last question. Um, you know, obviously, for the, on the Meaning of Podcast, we look into – the deeper meanings inside of filmmakers. And uh, one of the kind of things that I kind of found consistent through uh, a lot of your films are, is the idea of parentage and fatherhood, um, you know, from um, Andrew's uh, abusive father and Chronicle to the relationship of uh, Johnny Storm and Sue Storm had with Franklin Storm and Fantastic Four to Capone when it's, you know, a lot of uh, his relationship with his abandoned son who keeps calling. Um, is that, uh, does that common thread in your films come from something personal or is it just like a coincidence? It's, a, um, it, it's both, it's both personal and, and just coming from a uh, relatable curiosity, you know, like I, I, I don't, it's, you know, my own relationship with my family and different members of my family. It's always like it, it evolves like, um, where when I was a really little kid, I was really close with my mom and not so close with my dad. And then I got closer with my dad and then I got close, like, you know, and vice versa. My parents have been through a lot in their own lives. Um, my stepmom died when I was uh, 18 years old. When my dad, you know, lost his wife. I was in the room with him when he lost his wife. Um, and that, that, you know, fucking devastated him. And so he's been through a lot. I've, I've seen him go through a lot and I've always been very fascinated by the the idea of the sort of fractured patriarch um, as just as a character that I've seen in movies unrelated to my own personal experience as well as what I've experienced in my own life as it relates to uh, my my dad, my dad's dad and my mom's dad who are all three totally different dads and and totally different human beings. And then what I've witnessed of my friends growing up and their relationships with their fathers. And I've seen some fucking like really, really 
nasty abuse that's gone on in some of my friends' households that have made an, made an impression on me from the time I was a kid that I just couldn't really shake and I just thought about all the time. So it's definitely, it's very, it is very personal to me, but not in a, in more of like a composite sort of way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Josh, thank you so much for doing this, man. Again, we've told you many times, but we really do appreciate it. This has been an amazing conversation. No, thank uh, you so much. Yeah. I, I love every direction we've headed. We've headed down like uh, writing, editing, just like the blockbusters, indie movies. Like we've talked about pretty much every topic we can which is i think it's perfect um uh we would love to have you back on man uh maybe love talking it, yeah. about uh, a coen brothers movie yes uh, yeah we, we we should all do a barton fink break. there you go yeah I'm down for that. frame by frame <laughs> uh but either way man we appreciate you so much Same. um we're looking forward to whatever you're making in the future um where can everyone uh find you or follow you or keep up with you uh at joshua trank on twitter and Instagram, and then in real life, don't worry about it. I'm sorry. <laughs> don't worry about it. I know. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching and listening to this episode. Uh, you can subscribe to us at First Cut if you haven't done so already. That's where you can find more of us. Uh, follow us at First Cut TMO on Twitter and Instagram. And for the First Cut crew, I am Andres. This is RB3. I'm Sabrina. And that's Josh Drake. And, and we're pissing out. Frank, what's up? Yeah, we're pissing out, guys. Well, yeah, out. fourth honorary crew for right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay.